Jess and welcome back to my channel. Today I am very, very lucky to have a guest on my channel. You probably all know knew her before you knew me. It is Thorn Amuni, who originally was a writer and blogger for Pathios and now has her own book published with more to come. Welcome, Thorn. Hey Jess, how are you? Oh, I'm good. very, very excited to be here. It's always really fun being on another YouTuber's channel because I feel like I'm hanging out with my people right you know? <laughs> yeah it's always so fun to be able to to also like when you're on YouTube it's kind of fun to be on the other end of things where you don't have to do the editing for the content <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you just get to show up today and hang out and then leave after it's all good cool. <laughs> <laughs> um so we mentioned uh, right at the beginning that you are an author and that you've written for Pathios in the past. Um, are you still writing for Pathios or is that uh, ship sort of sailed? I'm just a really terrible blogger is really what it is. Officially, I write for Pathios. Oathbound is still there. Um, but it's sort of funny because when I was first brought on to Pathios in 20. 16 maybe um I was brought on by Jason Mankey and Jason told me um that he particularly was interested in me sharing my videos because he'd found me through YouTube and I had a blog I was blogging at Thorn the Witch um but he was interested in getting different kinds of media on Pathios and I sort of failed him right away because I didn't post videos because I was very self-conscious about my videos because uh, my style is I don't edit, I'm a little bit rambly. I've always just been a vlogger. Like YouTube used to kind of be just like this hub of people hanging out. It wasn't like a big info center. Um, and I failed him immediately by writing blogs instead of posting videos. Um, and over the course of years, you know, writing blogs is really difficult, especially on Pathios where I think readers tend to be really critical. So I got to feeling like, well, I can't just do anything right with my writing. Um, so I started posting my videos, which is funny because that's what Jason had wanted me to do from the beginning. And here I am like five years later, <laughs> finally doing it. So I'm not very regular, but yes, theoretically, <laughs> I am still a blogger. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got started with a lot more casual videos too. Most of my videos were recorded on like a tablet and then I just uploaded them like straight to YouTube from that. And then when they gradually made updates to the, to the app and I couldn't do that anymore, then I'd like upload them to Dropbox and oh, yeah. then upload them from my computer to YouTube. And then slowly but surely we learned how to edit and we, we learned some, some actual skills. Some of us, some of us did. <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny because, you know, you say that like you do these really rambly styles and I actually feel like you managed to convey the message of what you're trying to get across in your video, no matter how prepared or not you are, you really, I, I find that's the big difference. Like I can talk, I cannot always effectively communicate what I'm thinking about. So I do have to sort of sit down and like process stuff out, journal it, think about it before I can sit down and film. I feel like you, you kind of have the gift to be able to, to, to just go straight to the camera. <laughs> I appreciate that because I'm definitely self-conscious about it. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful to hear that. I always like say a tiny prayer, right? That I'll actually get what I want out into the world and I won't accidentally like offend massive groups of people. <laughs> so. You know, I think that's, 
not wanting to offend massive amounts of people is definitely a fear of mine as well. But I feel like at this day and age, really in order to offend like a whole bunch of people, really all you have to do is be female, even just a little bit fearless about expressing your opinion and, you know, not willing to put up with shit and it's automatically going to, to piss off a bunch of people and which is on top of it. So you definitely can't win to, to some extent. That's for sure. I think that there are some people who I don't mind pissing off and offending, but I, you know, it stings to do it accidentally, you know, and I think we're, we're living in an age right now where I think a lot of us are learning how to particularly be allies to marginalized communities. And there's so much that I think being, being a white person, being um, cisgender, being heterosexual, like there's so many things that I think like I have the privilege of not thinking about and then something will fly out of my mouth and it's like, okay, (laughs) it's time to do some self-examination and learn some things. Um, And I've certainly been in that situation and I imagine all of us have, particularly in the last couple of years. So it's a good thing. Um, But yeah, I think having that, you know, being, having that reflexivity to think about what it is you're putting on the internet and yeah, you're going to get trolls, um, but I'm pretty good at blocking that stuff out, blocking the trolls out. Yeah. Yeah. I do. um, If I get an actual bonafide real troll, it actually kind of makes me just a little bit giddy and excited because it's like, Ooh, I managed to piss off somebody enough to the point where they feel like they can almost like that they that they'll stalk my videos and leave multiple nasty comments on it's like all right time for you to get a new hobby you're you're yeah. leaving my channel now <laughs> Some people need hobbies or jobs or something <laughs> houses i don't know Anything. Sex toys like something <laughs> mm-hmm better use of the, of their time for sure. So, um, this book is, uh, officially got your name on it. You've Yay. been out for a couple of years now, I believe. Um, I've reviewed it on my channel. I've read it. I recommend it frequently. You probably already know all of that, but for those of you who don't know about traditional Wicca, can you tell us a little bit about what that book is? And sure. Um, yeah, so it, it came out of actually me being selfish because I run a gardenarian coven. Um, and for folks who aren't familiar with the gardenarian tradition, um, it's an initiatory coven based tradition. And we have a reputation for being like really secret and whatever. And I don't know that that's super fair, um, but folks usually find us. Um, through listings online, we usually, um, it used to be like Witchbox, which we don't have anymore, Um, but there are Facebook groups and folks um, interested in pursuing initiatory Wicca will reach out to us in various ways. And as a coven leader in the Gardnerian tradition, I noticed that increasingly seekers, folks who were interested, just were completely unprepared, both in the sense that they weren't real clear on what it was they were getting into, and they just didn't know how to approach a coven. And what I saw my fellow coven leaders doing, and I was doing this myself, were pointing people to resources that were written in sometimes the 50s. Um, Sometimes you see things into like into the 70s, but just like really dated material. And it's not that those texts aren't important. I think they are important, but it just seemed like such a shame that I get somebody who's like in their mid twenties, who's really excited about joining an initiatory Wiccan coven. And I'm telling them that they have to read something written in the mid fifties. That's both like really difficult to read, maybe out of print and also just not reflective of how traditional covens operate today. So I wanted to write a book that would serve those folks and make my my own coven leading easier. Like I wanted to be able to point people instead of having to answer the same kinds of emails over and over again, just be like, here you go, here's a book. Let me know when you read it. Um, So it was really about making my life easier. (laughs) I love um, how detailed you are explaining all of the different sorts of like Wicca and 
what those might entail and what to how, like even etiquette of how to approach a coven and things like that. Like the etiquette I think is so often not discussed and it really needs to be, I think it's it, yeah. how you address a coven for the first time is sort of like your job interview in a way. And, you know, if, if you're coming to the job interview for some fancy schmancy lawyer's uh, like office in jeans and a t-shirt, you ain't getting that job. <laughs> and if you email the coven leader, you know, with some poorly spelled, badly written email or text messages, you might not ever hear back from them. <laughs> well, I wanted to focus particularly on how to write an introduction, whether through email or if you're meeting somebody, if you have the good fortune of being able to sit down and um, you know meet coven leaders. I wanted readers to have a sense of what kinds of questions they might ask. Um, you see this in classrooms, right? Too, where like children don't know what they don't know, and oftentimes teachers will expect them. Well, if you if you don't understand something, ask a question. But children have to be taught how to ask questions. They have to be taught what. Um, what it is that they might need. And like, that's the teacher's job. And the same thing is true for adults. Uh, we don't just magically acquire these skills by becoming 18. Um, and what I was finding was it's not so much like you need to brush your hair and wear a tie as it is, you're more likely to get a response if you ask these kinds of questions versus what I usually get in my inbox, which is, I want to be a witch, teach me how to do spells. I want to join your coven. Like that email is just going to get deleted. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to give folks enough of a window so that they knew enough in order to get an inkling of whether or not these kinds of traditions are for them. Um, Cause they're not for everybody. And that's not a question of gatekeeping or like, we're so much better than everybody. It's that, you know, some people like basketball and some people like baseball. And if I'm over here playing rugby or something, and that's not what you want to do, I'm going to point you down to the local soccer team or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah just a absolutely. question of knowing what it is that you want. Yeah. Um, and I don't I believe that. Much. Yeah. I don't believe that seekers should have to, I should have that sprung on them. Um, so in writing the book too, this was kind of the other reason I wrote it was, you know, so much of the discourse about Wicca, not just today, but in the last, really in the last like decade, um, has been about very specific kinds of Wicca. Um, and I found increasingly that coven-based initiatory Wicca, what I'm calling traditional Wicca in this book, isn't usually represented. When people are talking about what Wiccans do and what Wiccans believe, they're often describing a certain kind of solitary eclectic Wicca that folks teach themselves either online or through books. And I'm not saying that that's not a valid way to practice, but it is very different. Mm -hmm. And I wanted a resource so that people who thought that they knew a lot about Wicca could actually realize that there's this whole other way of practice. There's this whole other style of Wicca out there that people just sort of either forget exists or sometimes I think people think we, we no longer exist. Like Wicca stopped being this way or something in the eighties and nineties, but that's not true. You're not the dodo bird. <laughs> right. Like traditional initiatory covens are still out there. Yeah. Um, we're just not necessarily like the sexiest thing on TikTok. Just <laughs> maybe not like the most active online either, because most initiatory covens are in person and don't need to have an online presence, except maybe for like a secret Facebook group that all the members can use to like talk with each other in between rituals and get togethers and things like that. Yeah, there are definitely um, there are definitely online platforms geared for people to find groups. Um, I know there are there are some large Facebook groups designed for seekers who are interested in exploring and finding out if there are groups in their area. And individual covens will do different things. Um, my coven used Slack for a little while. If you've ever if you're familiar with that platform, um, just to kind of talk in between. I've got. Um, a few of my initiates who are now running groups, they use Marco Polo to communicate. Um, a couple of them have made websites. And I think that there are more initiate voices out there 
Um, there are a number of Gardnerians writing books today. Um, and those folks might have, they might have websites or other resources. So I think you're seeing more, mm -hmm. um, which is cool. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a style of Wicca that I think people just don't think about. Yeah. And I, I like the, the book to point out to like other beginners who come to me like, well, what are good beginner books? And what are good, like, I want to learn more about what it's like to be a witch and, and what that entails and stuff. And so I really like pointing people in the direction of your book because it really gives you a, a lay of the land of like, hey, if this is the sort of witchcraft that you're interested in, this is what it's like you know, here's some good resources of, of what the different types are. What do you think fits you best? Where do you live? How do you think you can sort of like get in on it? It's definitely like you, like a seeker's guide is the subtitle. And I really think that that's the perfect subtitle for it. It really is helpful for kind of guiding people who are just on those first steps into the right direction. But I happen to know that you've got another book coming out soon. I do. I'm excited about the second one. And I think the second one has a much, much broader audience. So mm -hmm. traditional Wicca is very much, that's, that's a very niche book. Like mm -hmm. it was very, it's very much for folks who are, who think they might be interested in initiatory Wicca or who are curious about learning more. Um, and a lot of the advice in traditional Wicca, I think could apply to witchcraft groups broadly. Like there's a whole section about safety, um, sections about how to find other practitioners in your physical local communities, um, how to behave online, like that stuff could apply no matter what kind of witchcraft group you're talking about. But the second book isn't about Wicca and it's not, for people in groups specifically, I wanted to write something that was for all kinds of witches, regardless of what they think about the gods or if they're in a coven or if they've got a supportive community or if they're solitary, if they're an initiate, if they're a coven leader, whatever the thing is, because the thing that we all have in common is that all of us sometimes get stuck all of us hit plateaus, all of us get burnout, all of us deal with, okay, what are the next steps? And I, I really relied on my teaching background, um, particularly the work that I did with high schoolers um, in teaching reading and writing to take some of those strategies and go, okay, like how do we think about wherever you are, what do you do in order to take whatever the next steps are for you? Um, so I'm really excited about it. It was a difficult book to write, um, but I hope that it is helpful to more people. So traditional Wicca, definitely like more of a, a niche title. Um, but this next one is kind of like my, my love letter to, I think, witchcraft as a whole. Do we have a working title for the book yet? We have an official title. It oh. is called The Witch's Path, Advancing Your Craft at Every Level. Love um, it. I'm very excited about it. Um, I am very terrible at coming up with titles. Uh, when I was writing it, I was calling it Next Level Witchcraft. And you'll see little inklings of that in the book itself where like I'm gearing that, like I'm using these key phrases because I'm thinking that's what the book is going to be called. And then that was not the title. Um, but this is fine. This is Next Level Witchcraft is a stupid title. So <laughs> this one is better. <laughs> I think most publishers tend to take the reins when it comes to titling a book anyways. They, yeah. they have a lot more experience in what will kind of grab readers, what will sell more, what will show up in searches better and things like that. Because all of that can really affect a book's sellability or saleability. I'm something like that. I so, think it's saleability, but I'm not how sure. Much, how likely people are to buy it. Yeah, that's totally true. And I think I think probably readers don't necessarily realize that um, how involved the publisher is in not just the title, but in like whether or not there's an audio version and whether or not the, like the design of the book, how many pages is it gonna have? What's the cut gonna be? Like, how big is it? I mean, all of that stuff is determined by multiple people yeah. um, over the course of a lengthy period of time. So it, it's kind of funny getting on Twitter sometimes and people are like, I don't know why authors don't you know, aren't they more, more inclusive and why aren't they putting their books on audio? And it's just like, that has nothing to do with the author. You do not get to control that. <laughs> right. Like, oh, I can't believe that, you know, they picked like, why did the author do this with the title or like, 
no say. I mean, like, yeah. I think I think good publishers will consider the author's opinion, but the author isn't a publishing expert most exactly. of the time. Yeah. They're the writing expert, not the finishing and presentation expert. Yeah. That, that is that is what the publishing company is for. So kind of discussing like with the, the Wicca stuff, I think a lot of people have sort of come to see you uh, online, especially as like an advocate for other Wiccans because Wicca, as you put it, is not always the most, you know, popular or sought after tradition right now, mm -hmm. which surprises me because that's literally like the bulk of what most people's witchcraft knowledge is based off of or how most people start. So like, what do you think has really um, shifted within the last, like since we both grew up in the nineties reading, you know, like Teen Witch and Silver Raven Wolf and lots of Cunningham and all that kind of stuff. Like, what do you think has shifted in the last like 20 years or so that's really made people kind of step away from Wicca as a tradition and move towards other types of witchcraft? Several factors. I don't think it's any one thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think some things are maybe more interesting than others, but several things. Uh, first, I think it's important to say that there have always been other types of witchcraft. I mean, Wicca is the first um, kind of really publicly out there um, tradition. Formally but, established, outed, yeah. talked about um, in media, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, we really have to point to, like, you have to point to Gerald Gardner and to talk about a, a witchcraft revival, um, you know, for good or ill. Um, so there have always been other voices. So I think partially the reason why we see such an interest in other traditions is that other traditions now have more of a platform that they didn't necessarily have in the 60s and 70s, especially with social media. Um, obviously there are a, a number of publishers, there are tons and tons of books coming out about witchcraft right now. It's a very sexy topic um, and it's a sexy topic in a mainstream way. Um, so I think having a bigger forum, having more voices is necessarily going to lead to other perspectives and that's awesome. I think another component of that is that um, there, are, um, there are components of Wicca that I think are worthy of critique and I think increasingly people are doing that. I mean, what do you do with a tradition born out of British imperialism, like what do you do with that? Um, and you look at how these traditions um, it, during, during the occult revival of the 20th century and then you know, into, into the 21st, folks are asking questions now about gender and about race, and, right? Like those conversations are happening and I think that's naturally going to lead both to critique of the model that's already there, Wicca, um, and it's going to lead to folks wanting to pursue their own paths and answer those difficult questions, which is also awesome. The other thing though, that maybe is a little bit less awesome. And I think this is very natural. I think that one of the reasons why Wicca isn't popular anymore is because Wicca's history is now really well established. And you can kind of see that um, like people flipped their shit when Triumph of the Moon by Ronald Hutton was, was published. Um, and this is a thing that happens in religion broadly. This isn't just witchcraft. One of the ways that we collectively, human beings, particular, like particularly Americans, Americans are like really good at this. Um, we locate authenticity and authority in age, which is why if you look at American new religious movements, we practically always see some founder or some founding group going no, no, this actually connects to ancient times or no, no, like God themselves gave me this prophecy, right? Like there's this need to connect to some kind of ancient, more authoritative, authentic past. And Wiccans can't do that anymore, right? And for, I think most of us, those of us who are practicing, like that's not a problem. Like Triumph of the Moon was not a problem. The idea that Wicca is a contemporary tradition rooted in modern construction and like yeah it's got it's got ancient roots in the sense that we're pointing to the same things yeah revivalism people, of some like well I lost, mean like semi-lost traditions and but I mean thinking about like like traditional witches who point to things like 
um, trial records and folk traditions, like Wiccans have always done that too. Like we're pulling from the same sources, which is why I think our traditions look so similar. Um, but I think that one of the reasons why Wicca isn't popular is because people are still desperate for an authentic ancient witchcraft tradition that is somehow unbroken. And I think like you saw that with Robert Cochran, like one of the things that Cochran was critical about was, oh no, like these Gardnerians here are, that's a new tradition. Like they're making stuff up. I've got the real stuff, even though like Gardner, like even though Cochran has this wicked right? Like, yeah. so, and I think that that's a very kind of natural impulse. I'm not faulting other kinds of witches for that because all people do that. I think a lot of it too, like being like I'm in Canada, so I'm a little more north and a little more west from you <laughs> than you are. But like, you really see this, uh, like when when people ask you what you are, if you live in Europe in the UK, you know you're gonna say oh, I'm British or I'm German or I'm Spanish or I'm whatever here. People don't, I mean, like America will probably say I'm American, let's be honest, <laughs> but like Canadians <laughs> are going to be like, well, I'm, I'm Canadian, but these are my roots. And I think a lot of Americans do the same thing too. Like we can trace when almost all of our ancestors came to that's super, that's super waspy too. Like that's very like, a, that's a very like middle-class white person thing to do is like, oh, well, I'm 40% Irish and I'm 10% German. Like I, there's a meme that floats around every now and then that's like white people give you a math problem when you're <laughs> that's, that's totally true and I think I think that's why I think that's why like we're so obsessed with um like DNA testing like genealogy tracing I had um, mine done but I also my grandpa was um adopted and his adoption records are still sealed and I I don't know. I just sort of like naturally really am interested in genealogy. My mom actually has a degree in it from the University of Toronto. So I just sort of, and my grandma always used to do our family tree and stuff too. She still does. Uh, my mom's mom. And so like, it, it just naturally struck me as something interesting. So I wanted to know like what sort of that lost section of my family tree was and, and things like that. But do I think you need to have a DNA test to know or to be able to connect to something that's older than we are? No. Yeah, I mean, I always think about Bruce Willis and Pulp Fiction when he says, you know, like, I'm an American, like our names don't mean shit. Uh, and that's, that's kind of how I feel about like my own. And I mean, that's not something that's ever been important to me. Um, I wonder if it's because my family is so small. Um, like I I'm an only child and I grew up without grandparents. So it's just my mom and dad and me. And I've got, I've got other family who I met later in life and who I have relationships with now, but like I grew up on an army base. Like my, my parents are both officers and that was just like our immediate unit is what was important. Extended family wasn't really. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, like, I don't feel like knowing that would alter like my magical practice, but I think it's very natural that people are invested in that. Um, and I, I understand why in a search for authenticity with witchcraft, I think it's very natural for folks to want to look for something like ancestral roots. Um, and I think it kind of blows people's mind a little bit when like Wicca doesn't necessarily care about that. Yeah. Like individual Wiccans might, um, but like, it's okay to be like people, people hurl that at me. Like it's supposed to be an insult. Like, well, your tradition was founded in the 20th century. It's like, yeah, I think that's kind of awesome. Yeah, like it doesn't make it any less cool or valid to me. And mm -hmm. I think people need, just need to remember that, that this, like whatever type of witchcraft you're performing, it probably is not an unbroken lineage of thousands of years of witches. It's not. <laughs> it really <laughs> really isn't and that's okay <laughs> let it go <laughs> cue the frozen music uh -huh. <laughs> so um I, th I think we'll kind of move to another thing sure. about wicca too that i would like to to touch on with you because another thing that you're really known about for repeating something i've noticed a lot and something i've always been really interested in is 
why Wicca keeps getting compared with shamanism, particularly oh. in a lot of Cunningham's texts. Like, why does this keep coming up? Why is A, why do you think that this is a bad or even potentially harmful thing? And like, what do you kind of understand the difference between the two to be? Because for those who might be newer, a lot of people might hear shamanism and think, oh, well, it's just like, an ancient type of witchcraft before they called it that. So I think, I, I don't even know that it necessarily comes up all the time. I think part of the problem is that when we think about Wicca, when we recommend books about Wicca, we're still recommending books that were written in the eighties and nineties. And like, I think that's a problem. Um, and people have this idea that like, because they read Scott Cunningham back in like, you know, 1999 or whatever, when they were a teenager, they know everything about Wicca. Like people talk about it, like it's an introductory witchcraft tradition. And once you know enough, you naturally just like move away from it, which is super goofy. Um, but we're still pointing to some of those books and many of those books draw comparisons between Wicca and shamanism. It was very like de rigueur for the, for the decade. Um, so it's not that I think contemporary practitioners are comparing it or, or even that like, outsiders are necessarily making that comparison. I think it's that people read Cunningham and then they kind of stopped reading about Wicca. Um, and so like that comparison still hangs out. Um, and I point to that, I point to that example frequently because um, as like, I'm very grateful to Scott Cunningham. Um, that was one of my first books and I'm always going to love it. I think the problem is that we're recommending it to new folks today. I think that is a problem. Yeah. Um, because I don't think it's representative of how Wiccans practice today. And I don't think that it was ever a, like an embodiment of the tradition as a whole. Um, and people talk about it like it's some kind of sacred text or something. So I think you that's notice too that with Cunningham's stuff that he tends to do this thing where he like writes a chapter, which is like large print, double spaced, very vague. And then for more information, see my work on and then like another title that he has published. I mean, I think that was kind of just the thing in that decade, though, too. Um, I think I mean, because that was also in an age where. And I don't know anything about like Scott Cunningham's publishing contracts, but I know like that was in a time in publishing as a whole when people still had multi-book contracts mm. and most publishers don't do that anymore. Mm. So it was very important for authors in those decades to point to other works and to point upcoming works to tie their works together. Um, authors today don't do that. Like everything is pretty one and done. Like you've got a contract with Llewellyn, you write a book, that's it. You're not under contract anymore. Same with Wiser. Um, that wasn't necessarily the case in the nineties. Okay. Um, that I didn't know. So that's, that is good to Yeah. So I think that's, explain that. I think that's significant. Um, my hesitance broadly with the comparison is that First of all, with the conversations happening now surrounding cultural appropriation, I think we just need to be a little bit more conscious when we're talking about shamanism first, as if it's like a singular thing, because usually people aren't like referring to the specific tradition where the name originates. They're referring to something really broad, right? Which is the Tunis tribe in Siberia. Right, that's almost never what folks actually mean when they use the word shamanism. So first you have to ask that question. Um, but even if we're looking at like anthropological definitions, um, I think about like something that I always saw like when I was taking like anthropology classes when I was an undergrad was this idea that shamanism, like, you know, primitive religions, of course, this was like the the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, they still love to show, throw words like primitive, barbaric, and you know, savage is, around. You, you still see the phrase primitive religion sometimes. It is banana yeah. pants. Like, <laughs> um, oh. But what, what a lot of those texts would define as shamanism was, you know, this is, this is a person, he's a, you know, this person is somehow like an outsider who functions as like a spiritual center for a community and their job particularly is traveling in other realms, particularly for things like soul retrieval and healing. So there's this idea about healing. There's this idea about 
traveling in like spiritual realms beyond the physical. And there's this idea of being like kind of a community focal point. And so like for a, a contemporary witch, I think that definition gets kind of wonky when you think about the notion of like a community healer. Like we have this idea, I think that was very popular in like the eighties and nineties where like, oh, the witch is like the village healer. And like, I just don't see that. Like there are certain witches out there who like they see themselves in that way, but like, I'm not a community priest. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't travel to other realms to, to heat. Like I just don't to heal other people. Like, I think that's, that's maybe an ideal that some witches have. Um, but that's certainly not my ideal. And, and maybe not- there's some little like tiny villages or communities that do have like their, their witch who provides them with like some sort of like uh, herbal healing or, you know, like medicine type lore and, and things like that. But the reality is most communities don't have that. Most communities, when they have problems, if they are Christian, they turn to their churches or they seek private services like counseling and doctors and formalized services that used to belong to the shaman or to the village witch. Well, even that idea of the village witch as an herbalist and a healer has been pretty thoroughly critiqued in academic circles. Like that's another kind of one of our contemporary myths that was dissembled, you know, in in the 90s and in the early 2000s, like, the connections between witchcraft and herbal like and particular kinds of herbalism rather this idea of like the village healer like people are still going to priests for a lot of those things in like these medieval villages um so yeah i just i mean i think our histories are a lot more complicated than that and when we do something like equate groups you know wiccans and shamans etc or witches and herbalists or whatever like we're we're necessarily reducing things, I think, in a way that isn't always very helpful. Yeah. Um, so I try to just avoid doing that. I know a lot of, um, like there are some types of religious communities that actively really hate being compared to like any sort of paganism and stuff because they feel like it really um, dilutes the the sacredness of some of their own religions. Uh, um, Native, Indigenous, Aboriginal spirituality here in North America. They do not like being called pagan and being compared to us. They have their own flavors depending on their tribes and their locations across North America. Don't compare the two because they're not the same. Same with Hinduism. They really don't like it when they get compared to paganism either. Well, I think it's just a question of respecting other people and how they choose to define themselves. I mm-hmm. think that a lot of that that kind of movement, particularly in the 90s, was very much, I mean, like, paganism. We called it neo-paganism at that point. You really don't see that term anymore. You'll see contemporary pagan or sometimes just pagan, like capital P. But back when, like, neo-paganism was the thing, folks were really invested in establishing this collective thing as a legitimate religion. And in doing that, particularly in the United States, it's helpful to point to other groups and go, oh, we're like them, yeah. right? And you increase your numbers too if you're, if you're lumping other things in your definition. So I think people were kind of doing that consciously, partially. And I think also folks really did see and probably still do see um, kinship in yeah. these other traditions, whether because they're marginalized or because they see a connection with the earth and the natural world or something like people draw connections all over the place. And again, I think that's natural, but we have to be respectful when we're doing those things. I mean, I think the connections, I think sometimes they can be, the, the, the lines can be drawn between them for reasons of like similar things for how you see different uh, cultures in different parts of the world assign similar meanings to different types of plants or symbols or practice certain similar types of spiritual practices. I mean, humans are a traceable species that originated from one area of the world and spread from there. So like, you know, there, there's going to be some similarities in between them because as those different groups broke off and created their own cultures and civilizations, they would have 
obviously started off with some knowledge from you know their ancestors and things like that right so can you actually prove any of that probably not but do I think that it might explain some of the similarities in a lot of different shamanic communities and and cultures from around the world yeah I think so I think there might be a common sort of ancestral religion if you will that sort of started things off so there's a there's this scholar named um, Pascal Boyer who has a book that came out. I mean, he's written other things since then, but his big book was called Religion Explained. And I want to say it came out in, I don't know, between like after 2005. I'm totally making this up, right? In like the first decade mm-hmm. of the 2000s, everybody. Um, and one of the arguments that he makes is that religion is actually this really reasonable thing because it's rooted in certain kinds of evolutionary patterns that people just have. Um, so off the top of my head, it's been a long time since I've actually read this book. Um, and I recommend it. It's in the recommended reading of The Witch's Path when that comes out. Um, my reading list gets super weird, everybody. <laughs> um, but one of the things that he points out is we have like facial recognition patterns. I'm not, an, I'm not a, a biologist, everybody, so I'm going to butcher this. But basically, like human brains are designed to recognize faces, which mm-hmm. is why we tend to see faces in trees and in clouds and in, you know, there are certain things that our brains just do yeah, because we've evolved in a particular way. So it makes sense when we see patterns in otherwise disparate religious traditions, like in different places. Um, it's a very interesting book and I'm not saying I'm on board with absolutely everything in it. Um, but the idea that our spiritual traditions, our religious traditions, operate in comparable ways because there's some kind of not necessarily a universal human experience I don't know that that's a thing but like we we got the same brain essentially right the same kinds of like hardwired evolutionary patterns like recognizing faces Mm -hmm. or being afraid of the dark right there are certain things that we just seem to share yeah Um, so I don't know that we could we could talk about like you know a kind of like an ancestral religion but there seem to be things in our bodies that are, they create kind of proclivities for certain kinds of religious attitudes. How about That's that? a really good way of looking at it too. And I'm now going to have to find this book. <laughs> uh, it's B-O-Y-E-R. Oh yeah, he's French, I think. At least he has a French name. Yeah, that's definitely a French name. (laughs) So speaking of the subject of books. Yes. You you and I are both known for reading a lot. Oh, excellent. (laughs) Um, That looks like a nice red. Merlot? No, Cabernet. I'm a Cabernet girl. I like really dry wine. I like to kind of be in pain when I drink. Yep. No, Um, that's, that's dry reds are my favorite too. Merlot, Cabernet, uh, Chiantis, all of those. Mm. Can't talk about <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I just did the same impression the other day at uh, the grocery store when I saw a can of fava beans. <laughs> that movie's ingrained in my brain for the rest of my life. Um, so you and I are both known on the internet for reading a lot and and uh, recommending books and and things like that, um, but we have a slight different opinion on something. So I'm going to get just a wee bit controversial here. Do it. Do um, it. Bad books. You recommend that we read them from time to time, yes. and I tell people to save their coin and what are better books to read because I think that the other ones are just waste of time and space. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So let's let's discuss. Sure. Why do you recommend the bad books, the Scott Cunningham's, the Big Blue Book, all that kind of stuff? Well, and I, I wanna, I don't feel like we could we could call them bad books, like those particular ones. Like, so to me, we've got a few different categories here. Mm-hmm. When I when I think about bad books, I'm thinking about like, man. I'm particularly thinking about like, uh, I think of them as like marketing books. Like they're, you go to like, what is it called? Like Urban Outfitters and it's like Mm -hmm. beautiful hardcover and you flip through it and it's just really insubstantial. Yeah. Not even like maybe the information is wrong, but a lot of the times it's just like, it's just 
what even is this? Like the majority of it is pictures or it's just kind of frivolous. Um, so when I think about bad books, that's, that's like 80% of what's occupying my brain. I think something separate from that where we would put like the Cunninghams and Bucklands, et cetera. It's not that the books are bad, they're not. It's that they're reflective of particular periods of time and they're not necessarily relevant anymore. So like I've got a video on my channel it's one of my most watched videos, and it's also 100% one of my most misinterpreted videos, and it's called uh, Essential Witch Books. And when I say essential, and this is what the video is about, like I use the phrase in the video, it's not a surprise. I'm talking about cultural literacy, this idea that there are certain books that if you want to spend your life running around in witchcraft spaces and you want to be able to speak intelligently with other witches in different parts of the world, whatever, there are certain books that you are going to see over and over and over again. It's kind of like how if you're going to study literature in, the, in Europe or in North America, you have to have a working familiarity with the Bible. Sorry, you just do. Yeah. I'm not or saying that. Like, I'm never going to read Jane Austen or Charles Dickens. Right. If you're studying literature. Like, I'm sorry, those are prerequisite books. <laughs> and it's not, it's not because those are the best books ever. It's because they are referenced so much in other books that if you don't know them, you will miss them. If you have never read the Bible, and you turn around and you try to read like Toni Morrison or something, you're gonna miss giant chunks of what's going on because of all of this intertextual pointing. Yeah. And the same thing happens in witchcraft spaces. So it's not that you should read Gerald Gardner's Meaning of Witchcraft because it's an awesome book. It's not an awesome book, guys, spoiler. <laughs> I have suffered through that one myself. <laughs> It's because that book lays a foundation and other books refer to it. So that book, um, you can skip Ant, his fiction book though. <laughs> can you, can you, oh. if you don't, if you don't read high magic's aid and goddess arrive, like that's where we see the Wiccan read and the rule of three though. Like that's where we see a lot of these ideas originating. Yeah, I so, know. Like he, he like, kind of tried to put them in the novel to try to make it seem like it was something sort of no, because I guess he figured if he got it into popular culture that it could be well, it was illegal. More serious. It was illegal to write about to be a witch and to write about witchcraft. Exactly. So like that was how you did it. I think people don't appreciate that. Um, but like that, that is very true. It was technically it like, was illegal. Was the witchcraft <laughs> act repealed. Was I don't remember like, here, my, but he wrote he wrote his novels first. Yeah. Um, yeah. and it was. Yeah, it was kind of a cover, right? But so like Wicca, Guide for the Solitary Practitioner is one of those books. I would never give that to a beginner like here, this is the greatest book ever about how to begin practicing eclectic solitary Wicca. But I do think that people need to read it because it's referenced everywhere. And even people who don't cite it directly have this literary lineage to Cunningham. Same with Buckland. Um, I, I mean, I think this is true about Starhawk. Um, I think this is true about Paul Hewson, Mastering Witchcraft. Like there are certain texts that folks, I think, just should read at some point if they're able to. Not because it's gonna, not, not because it's going to teach them to be good witches, but because it makes it easier to understand what's going on in witchcraft communities as a whole. It's kind of like what we have, these common texts. So what happens is I have that video where I sort of lay out what I think of as essential books to be literate in the culture of witchcraft broadly. And it's got a lot of comments under it that say things like, well, these are terrible books. These are inaccurate or these have bad histories. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Where do you think those bad histories come from? Yeah. <laughs> Look. Um, the one so I will disagree with you on, though, is I think anybody can skip Silver Raven Wolf and just save themselves a whole lot of trouble. I just I think that so much of what she has written about has made its way into other like good beginner books these days but written much better and without some of the um like the, the thing I really take issue with in uh, to ride a silver broomstick there's a specific quote and it's like angels angels everywhere and mom and dad will never care and it's like oh, oh so now much. we're now That's we're teaching much. our children to lie to their parents 
first of all, parent, children should absolutely lie to their parents. <laughs> okay. They all lie. Hate to break it to you, mom. <laughs> well, they, I know they do. Yeah. So but the like, reason why I think Silver Raven Wolf is essential is because we don't have eclectic witchcraft available in bookstores without Silver Raven Wolf. Like we don't this, have that. This is true. This is true. So, well, I think you can skip I, it now though. I do. I think you can skip it now. Like she may have laid the foundation for it, but do I think it needs to be read now? I think her books hold up better than Cunningham do. Like yeah, I, just, I, I don't I think Cunningham's books hold up that great. Just no, they don't. I'm not saying that they're yeah. the best books ever written, but yeah. like I also think that some of the things that people criticize Silver Ravenwolf for either are just things that she didn't actually write or say. It's people parroting what they heard somebody say on Tumblr. Yeah. Or it's stuff that everybody does but Silver Ravenwolf is the one that's penalized for it. And it I think really, some of that, I think some of that is rooted in misogyny. I think she kind of got like, because her books did become so popular. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people just like realized once her books kind of came out, what some of the problems were with a lot of her books, as well as a lot of other people's books that were being released at the same time. And then kind of went, all right, enough's enough. Like you, the, the whole like 9 million witches thing that's been quoted in like Phyllis Currot did that. Silver Ravenwolf did that. And like dozens of other publishers, but who's the one who's generally crucified for it in online Silver space? Ravenwolf. It's Silver Why Ravenwolf. is it, right? Why is it? Cause Buckland and Cunningham said those things too. Right. Yeah. But like, we don't, we all love, we all love Cunningham. Right. But the bad histories are in those books too. It but is. we don't, we don't drag Scott Cunningham into the square for a public flogging. We only do that to Silver Ravenwolf. I mean, I tend to drag Cunningham into the public square for flogging for other things. So but collectively people don't like when you get on Twitter and Tumblr, people are still mad about Silver Ravenwolf. Yeah. People don't say things like that about Raven Grimasi or Ray Buckland, or Scott Cunningham. And you know what those folks have in common? They're men. Yeah, like, exactly. I that pretty strongly. Yeah, um, I absolutely agree with you. There's a huge amount of misogyny within it, which is odd in a way, because so much of Gerald Gardner's stuff in particular is like talking about things like the fivefold kiss on women, but they don't do the same for the priest section in rituals, at least not as far as what I have been able to to find and and that's that's weird like they're very like pro-feminist within the circle but certainly within like when it comes to writing stuff down and getting stuff out there and publishing in academia suddenly it's all about the men again and well I think that I think witchcraft has a misogyny problem and I think one of the reasons why it's so insidious is because we don't think we have that problem we think that we're really liberal and like awakened or something um, but I think that this is still true. I think if you look at, like, look at a festival roster one day, like who are the headliners? Who are the best-selling authors? Who are the loudest voices on the Facebook group or the listserv or whatever? Who are the people out there publicly teaching? Who are the people who we reference over and over and over again? And they are men, they are men, they are men, right? Gerald Gardner, Ray Buckland, Scott Cunningham, Christopher Penzat. And I love these people. This is yeah. not me criticizing men, okay? Um, and the fact that I even need to say that, I think is a problem. But yeah, like, <laughs> but that's who we point to in our community. And we can do it because we say like, you know, oh, but witchcraft is primarily, is primarily women. Hey, men are witches too. Hashtag man witch or whatever. But like, I mean, I feel like I'm still being like subjected to patriarchy in witchcraft spaces. Um, I would agree. It's and to see why I don't practice with other people. <laughs> well, it's not, it's not, the problem isn't covens. I mean, my coven is mostly women. Yeah. The problem is, the problem is online. Like yeah. online is not practicing with other people. No, um, no, it's not. So well, yeah. I, I absolutely agree with you on a lot of that. It, I didn't mean um, to go on a tirade, sorry. <laughs> hey, this is the place for it. <laughs> um, not going to critique you for that 
at all uh, because I have definitely gone on my fair share of tirades. I think YouTube is where we tend to see like not very many men do channels about witchcraft. I think in particular YouTube can feel like a, a male vacant space and most of the male witches who are on YouTube are heathens, which is great, but I know there's a lot of male witches that that wish that they had other oh, people yeah. that they could turn to. And that's there's, fair. That's absolutely fair. There's definitely um, a representation problem. Absolutely. Yeah. But when it comes to power, influence, and money, it's men. Yeah. But I'm not like, because abs you're absolutely right. Influencers, um, YouTubers, et cetera, like we still see primarily women. And I think women, like that's kind of the base. Like I look at my, my YouTube and my Instagram demographics. Do you ever do this? My that's audience, is, my audience is 90% women. Yeah. Mine's like 99. <laughs> yeah. But I'm, I mean, I sit over here and I look at my bookcase and who's here. Chris Rupenzak, Matt Oram, Evo Dominguez, Raven Gramasi, Ray Buckland, uh, right. And like, it's not because like those guys are problems. They're not. Okay. I love those folks. Yeah. Um, I think part of it is that there's kind of this cultural impulse broadly where like men are, and like, I see this in the workplace. Men are more likely to take certain kinds of risks. I think they're, they're less likely to be self-conscious about their ideas, not being good enough. Women, I think like, um, I don't know, like you see this in like corporate spaces, women are less likely to ask for raises, women are less likely to speak up if they're being exploited. A man just statistically is much more likely to be like, oh, let me take a risk and send a book proposal. Yeah. Um, and I, it, I don't think that that's a problem. I think what we need to do is encourage more women. It's not yeah. that I want men to stop writing. <laughs> I don't, these books are great. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's a disparity that we should talk about. Yeah, I think the other big disparity that that doesn't get enough talk about in within the online witchy community is the inherent transphobia that often ends up happening, particularly within like a more um, closed Wiccan space. I hear a lot from other people that a lot of covens won't take trans people because they're concerned about when clothes come off at ritual, that how those how they're going to be interacting with it. It's a lot of people I think can deal with a trans person when they're clothed and they're presenting the way that they want to present, they can interact with that person. But when the clothes come off for sky clad ritual, that's when it can get a bit different, right? So I don't have direct experience with that myself um, just because the, the closed covens that I interact with and I, I do this on purpose, mm -hmm. are very consciously not that way. Um, but I have heard um, a number of stories, particularly on Twitter, like folks share their experiences with discrimination in initiatory Wiccan spaces. And I don't doubt that it happens. I know it does, okay. Um, but my coven and the covens that we associate with go out of their way to to not be that way. And that's not to say that everybody's perfect all the time. We're definitely not. Um, but I think that there is a movement happening right now in traditional Wiccan spaces that is very inclusive, um, which is not to downplay transphobia where it happens, but I think it's dangerous to pin it on Wiccans, which I think- No, and I don't think it's necessarily that. specifically Wiccans. I think that's where most people tend to be more vocal about it because those tend to be, like a lot of the covens that you see that that have open ritual that are more open online those ones do tend to be like more like initiatory covens they 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 have processes and things like that they might have a history and like so when something comes in that's never been dealt with before it can certainly be difficult for that coven with a history to then know what to do and that's fair enough like to not know how to tackle a new problem the first time it comes up like that's when but it's the willingness to be open it's the willingness to learn it's the willingness to be a safe space and I don't think it's just Wiccans though absolutely not there's a lot of other witchcraft uh you know like more eclectic witchcraft covens or specific type of witchcraft covens that have definitely left that bad taste in the mouth within the the trans community who also happen to be pagan and um 
for yeah. like, You're on my channel for a reason because I know that you are yeah. not transphobic. <laughs> um, well, I think that too, like um, the other kind of area where these things happen, and again, like, I'm not an expert, but I do read a lot of books, right? Um, yeah. Is we talk about radical feminist communities. We talk about um, traditions of witchcraft that really emphasize particularly um, the, the woman's body, this idea that like power lies in menstruation or the uterus or childbearing or something like that, which is necessarily going to be exclusive. Yeah. Um, I mean, this was something that I found, I, I get in trouble every time I say this, but I'm, here I go, right? Like when I read um, the Spiral Dance and other witchcraft texts in the 90s and the early 2000s, I felt very alienated because like I'm, I'm a woman um, that's never been a question as far as how I, how I feel confident in identifying, um, but I'm child free. Yeah. And I don't like my period and I'm not grateful for like my boobs or menstrual cramps or what I don't think it's beautiful. I think it's gross and I wish it didn't happen. And I tried to get my tubes tied when I was in my twenties and nobody would do it. And like, so I had this very fraught relationship with my body and with like traditional womanhood. And I felt very alienated by witchcraft communities that emphasized like the triple goddess or yeah. like, like I found that very, very alienating as a, as a cis woman. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't thinking about other genders. Um, and now right like I say like like it's not a new thing right but this is a thing that I think is on the fore of people's minds yeah now it's clear that those kinds of spaces are exclusive to a lot of people um so I know like one of the books that um has really been pointed to as a source of transphobia is Lisa Lister's uh, witch is that what it's called witch yep. right? Yeah, um, and COVID like and love your lady landscape they're right. very I mean, but I, th I think those books can serve a, a good purpose too. Like having read all three of Lisa Lister's books, mm -hmm. I, I think that the, what she is trying to do with those books is inherently good. The intentions are right. She is trying to really help educate women about their bodies and about like witchcraft and pagan cultures in a way that's accessible for a lot of people. But does she at all address in there people who are trans or might identify as women who weren't born with those female reproductive organs? No, she doesn't. And that is where the exclusion comes into play. And I can understand why people don't like those books. Yeah. Um, so, and I, I bring them up just to say that this is a problem that is endemic in the entire movement. Mm -hmm. I think it's convenient right now to point at Wicca as a scapegoat. And I'm not saying that that's what you're doing, but I think like collectively this happens like, yeah. oh, so, you know, cultural appropriation and transphobia are just, that's just Wicca. Like if I don't practice Wicca, I don't have to watch myself as far as cultural appropriation. And like, that's, that's what we want to <laughs> avoid because like, these are problems that impact all of us and they are things that everybody needs to be exploring in their own traditions. Hey, where am I a racist? Where am I being transphobic? Where, like, those are questions that we need to be asking ourselves, especially those of us in positions of privilege. And that's not because I'm a Wiccan, that's because I'm running around as a cis middle-class white lady in the United States. Like I got a lot of shit to check. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, there's a I, lot of places that you can accidentally slip and say something that has good intentions behind it, but actually can be a really horrible thing for somebody else to hear. Or just genuinely not know. It's not yeah. even just people slip. It's that this is actually like a, a self-education process that we need yeah. to engage in. And I think what happens with folks, they don't do it on purpose. It's not because they have bad intentions, but folks go, oh, all of those problems just belong to X kind of witchcraft. If I practice this kind of witchcraft, I don't have a problem. So I brought up Lisa Lister because she's very adamant about not being Wiccan. Yeah. And yet here we have the same kinds of problems that people are like, oh, that's just a Wiccan problem. Yeah. Like, no, this is a witchcraft. Pro this is our whole community, everybody. It's not like it's just Wiccans who suck. We all suck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sorry. <laughs> 
We all have lessons to we learn. All suck. Yeah. I mean, like, it can, oh, like, it, it's so easy when you start off on a witchcraft path to start to think of yourself as being better than like maybe some of the more cons conservative Christian counterparts or where you've come from and be like, I am better than them. But, you know, bringing that holier than thou attitude into any space is, is when you're going to start to run into problems for sure, whether it's witchcraft, Wicca, Christianity, whatever. I think really trying to adapt that whole, like, I'm here to learn from you, no matter what you identify as is really the attitude that's the most helpful to to adopt and like you said where am i being racist where am i being transphobic where am i being you know uh, exclusive towards other people like i had a subscriber of mine a couple of years ago ask me if i would start listing decks in the description box mm -hmm. um because the closed captioning that I had activated on my videos didn't always do a good job of, of translating. So she asked if I would list the decks and books so that she could go and, and refer to them. And that's mm -hmm. like, that opened my eyes to how ableist am I? Like that was something I never thought that I well, was in a way, but here, uh, let me let me drop this too. This is important, um, and this is this is a particular like focal point of mine. I think because of my my background as an educator. But how ableist is it that our community insists that everybody reads? Like, what's the first thing that happens when somebody asks how they can start getting involved in witchcraft? We give them a fucking reading list. Can yeah. I swear? I just did. Like, you can swear um, here. Like, Mommy has a potty mouth. <laughs> <laughs> we, give them, we give them this massive reading list. We tell them, do your research. Like we basically tell them to become historians and scholars yeah. and we send them on their way. And like, what do you do? And I, I run into this as a coven leader. Like, what do you do with folks who it's aren't readers for all kinds of reasons, whether because like they don't have the skill sets that we, like we all think we were like inborn with, like we weren't, we learned them. And a lot of us learn them in college, which by the way, most people don't go to. <laughs> so, like there's that. And then also these books are expensive. Like, have you ever yeah. noticed that all of the advanced witchcraft books are super expensive, like on specialty presses, like Three Hands and Troy Books? I'm like, I love those books. I've got them all over here. Okay. But like, let's not pretend that that isn't just classism. It, it, it absolutely is. I think it's something that's uh, totally different, even that's very classism as well, is um, the zero waste movement. And mm -hmm. like having to make sure that you're buying the right types of cutleries or jars or like lunch things and stuff like that. Some of them are expensive. And if you're trying to reduce your waste and be good to the planet, it can end up costing you more in wow. the end, which is, it's difficult. But like, my husband and my oldest daughter, my stepdaughter, they're both dyslexic, both mild, but both mm -hmm. dyslexic. So I certainly have tried to be conscious of like, even though I love to read and I love to tell people about the books that I'm reading, I also try to link people towards like channels or documentaries or other services that they could watch or they could listen to and, and things like that, that would make it easier to access some of the same types of information. And that's something we just don't think about at all. A lot of, a lot of the time, like it blows people's minds when I tell them that my coven doesn't have a reading list. And <laughs> like for all kinds of reasons, I made a video at some point, but like we don't have a reading list. And I think folks don't realize that reading is a barrier for all kinds of reasons. That is a way that we gatekeep. And I'm not like, obviously I'm not gonna shit on anybody who wants to read. By all means, read all the things, buy the expensive books, God knows I do. <laughs> but you cannot make those things a requirement to be a part of your witchcraft movement and then claim that your witchcraft movement is inclusive. Exactly. <laughs> you just can't do that. Yeah, exactly. Like, do I have the resources to sit down and personally teach all of the new people that come through my channel space? 
No, but one of the ways I can make some information accessible to other people is to make my videos and talk about things. Like last week, we did a video about like the difference between the pagan, like Wiccan style wheel of the year and then the Druidic style, because this is not something that's compared and contrasted very often. And, you know, like, what are those Sabbaths? What are those festivals? What are the differences between them? <laughs> and, you know, that that's not something that you're necessarily going to find in a book. Um, I think that's why it's so great that we're seeing other mediums. Like, I know folks complain about, like, witchcraft on social media, witchcraft influencers and whatever. And, like, I've done a little bit of that complaining myself, too, in the past. But when you think about it in terms of access, like, how awesome is it that people can get on any platform and learn without being judged, without having to have a lot of money, without being scholars, without having college educations, without, I mean, like, that's awesome. And I don't think we should be shitting on that. I, I agree. Like if you, when I was a kid, I would have given my right arm to be able to go onto YouTube and watch videos of people talking about their practices. Like that's how I've learned so much over the years, or at least open my eyes to different types of practices and, and things like that. And ultimately, do what I love to do most is to get into a good book and really deep dive into a topic. Absolutely. That's something I absolutely adore. It's just who I am. I've been reading since I was four years old and, you know, an avid reader, but for those people who don't and can't or, or find it difficult to read, there are a lot of other really great ways to learn things. And yeah, it's, it's definitely you know, like it's one of those things, how, how ableist am I? How classist yep. am I? And how can we change that a little bit? Yep. I think that's, that's why it has to be an ongoing conversation. And it's heartening to me that I think increasingly it is. Um, but it's, it's always a process, you know? Um, yeah. So I'm, journey, I'm, for sure. I'm, I'm glad that more folks are engaging with it you know, and I certainly try to, like, obviously, as I said, there's, you know, nobody's perfect and there's going to be failing. Um, but I think leaving that dialogue open, keeping kind of that beginner's mind and, you know, realizing that there's always, there's always more to learn, I think is the best default mode to have. Um, and just being kind too. like, if, if your, if your baseline assumption is I should be kind to other people, like that'll, that'll get you pretty far. Yep. Treat other people how you want to be treated, right? It's all it's all down to that. Um, so I think we want to leave the video here. We've we've talked for quite a while and we've covered a lot of ground. But before we go, I'm going to ask you the question I ask everybody. Tell us something random about yourself that other people wouldn't know. Um, growing up, I wanted to be an entomologist. I was actually a biology major for my first three years of college. And I was, I really wanted to work specifically with cockroaches. Um, so I know a stupid amount about bugs. Um, I ended up switching to English because, not because I love books. Like I do love books, but I actually like really sucked at reading. Like I was, people are always like, oh, I was talented and gifted. I was not, I was in the lowest reading group. Um, I majored in English because I dropped biology because I couldn't take an insect collection. And I realized that entomologists tend to just work for like pesticide companies basically. Um, oh. so I switched, yeah, um, I switched. And the reason I settled on English was because I went to a university that threw you out after four years, there was a time limit and English required the fewest number of credits to finish the major. So that's why I was an English major. Um, but yeah, I know a lot about bugs and I actually really don't like literature. <laughs> Even hey, though I'm about, to, enough. I'm, about, I'm about to have a master's degree in it, but whatever, it was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> Funny how life turns out, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, one more yeah. question for you, just because I'm sure. curious. If you had to pick a classic author from literature that you do like the most, who would it be? Oh, just like literature as a whole? Yeah. Classic literature, let's say. Um, 
probably George Eliot. Um, you know what? No, I think, especially this is a witchcraft channel. You like spooky shit. Yep. Y'all should read Elizabeth Gaskell. Go read Lois the Witch. Um, it's, I guess, I guess it's a novella. I don't know. That's a new word, right? Um, but she's, she writes spooky shit. She's a, she's a Victorian author. She's amazing. Um, Lois the Witch is a great starting point. It's spooky. It's magical. Um, I specialize in Victorian literature and I'm all about women of that era, which is why I immediately went to George Eliot. Um, and there you go. Also, if you're at a bar or you're dating and you're with a dude who tells you that his favorite book is Catcher in the Rye or Fight Club, you need to leave. <laughs> that, is, that is a sign that he is not, he is not the one for you. Yeah. <laughs> Based on my, based on both my, my educated literary opinion and also my extensive experience in bars. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, I'm, I am firmly a Jane Austen lover. I am an Austenite, um, but I also have a soft spot for Charles Dickens. And I love uh, Charles Leo, Dickens too. I yeah, almost Leo went for Charles Dickens, but then I got, you know, tired of men. So I didn't say Charles Dickens. <laughs> I do like Charles Dickens and I do like Leo Tolstoy. Anna Karenina, I read cover to cover in like less than a week because I just really genuinely loved it. <laughs> yeah. Nope, there you go, Elizabeth Gaskell. Okay, I've got that written down. I am going to do some digging for sure. Oh, also this, I, I wouldn't necessarily put her on my list. She's a little bit later too, uh, but read Precious Bane by Mary Webb. It's also very witchy. Um, like B-A-N-E, like B-A-N-E. B-A-N-E. Mm-hmm. And it's what was about her name? Uh, Mary Webb, W-E-B-B. Uh, Precious Bane is about a woman who is born with a cleft palate and Ooh. her basically that that marks her as like a witch basically, right? She's an outsider. So it's mm-hmm. all about her and it's spooky and witchy and you will like it if you like Jane Austen. That sounds right up my alley. I am definitely going to have to give that a go. Yay, books. Yay, books. <laughs> Could not talk to you and get a couple of, and like, and not get a couple of book recommendations out of it at the end, right? There you go. Uh, all right. So, uh, Thorne, where can we find you on the interwebs? Um, you can find me right here on YouTube. Um, my username is Drawing Kenaz, like the rune, K E N A Z. But if you just, search Thorn Mooney, my channel will pop up. Um, and then on Instagram at Thorn the Witch and Thorn does not have an E on it, nor is it Thorin like the dwarf. It's just Thorn like the pointy thing on your rose bush, the witch. Perfect. And I'm going to link all of Thorn's social media down below. So if you guys would like to catch up with her on any of those spaces, you certainly can. Hooray. It's been wonderful to have you here had such a fun time talking with you. Yes, thank you. Definitely managed to to change my mind about some things a little bit. And I I I appreciate that. (laughs) I I love it. I love to have those types of conversations. Like, all right, this is my opinion. This is why I think I'm right. This is what you think. Let's let's have a discourse. Let's let's talk back and forth. I love it. All right, so hopefully Thorne will be on the channel again in the future. I would like that to be. It sounds like she would too. So um, thank you everyone for watching today. And um, yeah, go hit subscribe to Thorne's channel if you haven't already. And until we speak again, be wise, be brave, and be magical. Bye.